Um, so this short-term interim stuff uh, has, has, has got people started a long time ago predicting the demise of S&MP and, um, and, in the, and uh, that this is the new silver bullet that's going to replace S&MP. I have some slides on that later on. Uh, they're kind of fun to look at. Uh, and they just appear and then they claim what they're going to do and then they disappear. And that's been happening year after year. So this framework then has three parts. It's more than just a protocol, and this is sometimes what's confusing because sometimes when we talk about SNMP, we're talking about the protocol part of the framework, and sometimes we're talking about the whole framework. Um, just like um, uh, sometimes we say, I, I need a Kleenex, but we really mean we need a facial tissue. Sometimes we mean the, the and sometimes we mean the, uh, I, I, you know what I'm trying to say, even if I'm not saying it well. So the framework, is a data definition language based on the structure management information, or SMI, and you want to call that SMI, you don't want to call it SMI, that would be a bad thing. The MIB, the management information base, and the protocol, three separate independent parts. So the first part has evolved, the second part has evolved, and the third part has evolved, and they've evolved independently. Let's look at how the first part, the data definition language, has evolved. The first generation of the data definition language was uh, used from 88 through 91, and then, and then the second version was from 91 through 93, and those were generally called SMI version 1, two different versions of SMI version 1. And the third generation uh, is what we've been using since about 1993, called SMI version 2. The fourth generation has just begun as a work in progress in the IETF, a thing called SMING, and I'm afraid it's already too late to stop it from being called SMING. Not my favorite terminology. So what are some advantages of SMI version 2 over SMI version 1? Well, ever since 1995 or so, it was first introduced in 93, a couple of years for it to mature and get into place. Since about 95, all information modules that are produced, whether those are standard MIB modules or those coming from a particular vendor, should be written in SMI v2 format. There are several benefits of that, some new data types, table indexing was made more clear, and there are improved set operations through the row status textual convention. But the pragmatic reality for you as operators and administrators is that um, while most management stations and applications can slurp in a MIB that's written in SMI v2 format, a few still require SMI version 1 format. So it's inevitable that you're going to need both. Now it turns out that the information that's in SMI v2 formatted documents is a superset of that found in SMI v1 documents. So if you have the v2 format and you want to produce v1, you run it through an automatic tool that throws away the information and moves the bits around on the page and spits out the older version. But if you have the older version and you want to translate it into the new version, the tool that you use is edit or VI. Um, and then you get to type the information in um, that, 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 that was thrown out if you're going the other direction. And so uh, it's, it's, it's much more labor intensive. So the pragmatic reality is you want both, and you, so you want V2 because you can get V1 from V2 format. It's also worthwhile to mention at this point that regardless of the grammar of the MIB document, the general rule, and you have to have an exception to allow you to have a rule, but the general rule is that any MIB grammar, any of those five boxes in that blue box that I started with, works with any version of the protocol. So you can use an SMI v1 MIB with an SMMP v3 engine, you can use an um, vice versa. Um, you don't have to change your MIB definitions to upgrade your protocol definitions. The only noteworthy exception is, is that counter 64, 64-bit counters, which were introduced in 1993, are not compatible with SMI, SNMP version 1 engines, but there are rules for how you skip over them. So, early SMI version 1, late SMI version 1, proposed standard SMI v2, draft standard SMI v2, full standard SMI v2, different ways of expressing MIB documents, and the more time went on, the smaller the changes got until we converged in on a solution that's really, really pretty good, is used to write MIB documents in a manner which is independent 
of the protocol definitions. It is a protocol independent data definition language. The second part of the three-part specification are the MIB definitions themselves that are written in these various grammars. Those MIB definitions can be standard or non-standard, like standard ones would be those produced by certain work of the IETF and other standards bodies, or it might be coming from a non-standard document like a particular vendor proprietary extension, making non-standard extensions in a standard way. These MIB definitions are protocol independent and should work with other management protocols in addition to all three dialects of SNMP. So it gives you the management information base and this, uh, the evolution of this part of the specification has been constant since 1988, mostly expansion. And as a result of that work, there have been a wide variety of technologies instrumented through standard MIB definitions and others have gotten covered through vendor-specific extensions. <clears throat> now, when we first started this in 1988, there was the MIB committee. There was the SMI committee, the MIB committee, and the protocol committee. But, and that group produced MIB-1 and then later produced MIB-2. But, and when MIB-2 reached full standard status, which was a superset of MIB-1, MIB-1 became historic. But around 1992, there was a change in strategy. And instead of having the MIB committee, we moved to a model where we had a number of committees working on various parts of the MIB with differentiated staffing. So instead of having everybody in one room, we would have in this room, we'd have the FDDI weenies working on the FDDI MIB, and in this room, the, the Ethernet weenies. Weenie is not a pejorative word at our place. Um, um, they'd be working on the Ethernet MIB and so forth. And this differentiated staffing, having the experts being able to work on, in their own area of expertise, got us MIB documents that were designed by and for experts. And a bad thing that happened, and it allowed us, because people were working in parallel, we were able to crank out MIB documents much more rapidly. But a bad thing that happened was, in the early days of the IETF, there wasn't this big difference between the vendors and the victims, um, that, that there wasn't this big difference between the IETF and NANOG, um, that the, the, the people who were the producers of the standards were also the consumers of the standards. And people that went to the MIB-1 and MIB-2 committees were about equally divided between operators and producers of networking technology. But when we went to this differentiated staffing, we lost almost all input from people who were actively involved in running and operating networks and systems and the like. That was, so this change in strategy was a good thing, but like most good things, it also had a bad thing to go with it. Um, it had its pros and its cons. There are attempts to address that, and later this week, for example, the IETF is going to have a meeting at the end of this week, um, starting uh, tomorrow evening and continuing through Wednesday, where the IETF is working to actively solicit input and exchange with those people who are actively involved in operating and administering networks and systems today, because that input is, is sorely needed. I'm reminded of, a, of an allegoric story, this is not a true story, but the Refrigerator MIB Working Group met in a hotel room in Dallas, Texas, and they met for a week. They had experts on refrigeration from all over the world. They came up with this big fat MIB document the size of a phone book. It had everything in it you could want. It had, it had the, refrigerate, the refrigerant group, and it had the partial pressure and the freon type, and the freon temperature, the freon for low rate, and it had the ambient temperature inside the cabinet, outside the cabinet. It had the insulation type, the insulation thickness. They even went so far as to measure both the voltage and the current of the bulb so that you could, A, learn whether that light really goes off when the door is closed, and B, if you had voltage but not current, it would send you a notification that the bulb needed to be changed. This thing was just, it was really something. And then they took it to a NANOG meeting, and they showed it. And the NANOG group, you know what they said? 
said, we don't like it. And the refrigerator MIB working group chair was just, just totally perplexed by that. Why? What, what have we missed? What could we possibly add to this? And the NANOG group said, no, no, this isn't what I want at all. I just want a single green light. It says, beer is cold. That's, that's all I want. Just. <laughs> and that's what happens when you don't have that pragmatic input from people who are going to use it. You get something that's designed by experts for experts, and it isn't tempered by that real-world input by people who have to put it to use. So we really want your input and your, your involvement. Well, at any rate, back back to reality uh, and 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 avoiding my fictitious story here many of the documents that have been produced by by this differentiated staffing approach are now on the standards track at various levels of maturity proposed standard draft standard full standard in the standards committee and various levels of support and involvement and use and application and products in the marketplace uh, small medium and large there as well now, many of these then produced so far are adequate for monitoring but must be supplemented for configuration and control, and we either need to do more standards work on that or, in the meantime, we have to use enterprise-specific extensions in the absence of standards for control and configuration operations. As that MIB has evolved, it has expanded in scope, and the expanded scope of the MIB is reflective of the expanded scope of application of the Internet Standard Management Framework. Today we're seeing that the framework is not only used in its traditional role of network management, but it's increasingly also used for monitoring the systems that connect to the network, the applications that run on those systems, and the services that those applications provide in a seamless manner and, and using the term network management in its most expansive sense. Also including the proxy management of legacy devices, um, such as those devices that might have an RS-232 port and do an ASCII interface to a console, but don't, don't otherwise speak SNMP in a native fashion. So I've divided the MIB documents that are available today to just show you some of the scope into some categories here. There are a number of documents in the area of network management, um, and all kinds of networking technology has been instrumented. In terms of treating the network as a service, uh, there are three documents at least in that space, and a number of documents oriented towards monitoring the system and applications that run on those, like the application MIB and the, and the SysApple MIB, host resources MIB, and so forth, as well as ones oriented towards particular services like the domain name system, the www MIB, mail monitoring MIB and the like. So the point here then as we've evolved, we see that the framework is not just for manage, ma managing networks, but it's really today's only relatively open, relatively complete, open, multi-vendor and multi-platform interoperable standards-based solution for managing uh, our entire infrastructure. Now we think this seamlessness between not only the network but the systems and the applications and services is real important. And the way that you get that is by having consistent data definitions, consistent data naming. The protocol is not as important in that regard, but we have to start at the bottom where we have SMI-based instrumentation, that is MIB objects. We move the data via SNMP. We have applications that convert the data into information and information into data. Information into data is where you're taking the configuration intent and moving it down to being very specific configuration of minute details, uh, user interfaces, and then the sharing amongst cooperating management applications. Well, the, the Internet Standard Management Framework focuses on these two layers, but if we want to have the layers above continue to work together, we have to have consistent naming and consistent data definitions throughout. This is important because no single application can do everything for everybody, so sharing is essential, and as I said, naming scheme, data definitions, and semantics are very important. We find that mapping functions don't work well. What you'll often have is this management station and this management station with swivel chair integration, one runs on an NT box and one runs on a Unix workstation, and you have to go between the two. 
Well, and then there's an attempt to try those, tie those two together into an umbrella kind of a manager and suck data out of the top. Well, that, if you don't have consistent naming schemes, you don't have consistent data definitions, you have to use mapping functions. And those of you who've been in data communications for a number of years know that every time you put in a protocol converter, you lose. Um, so here's an example. You're, you're trying to, you get a phone call and somebody wants to understand why did the network not behave correctly at 2 o'clock yesterday, why could the boss not read email? Um, you don't normally worry about email, but when it's the boss, you... you know, when I ran a network at the University of Tennessee, we, ran, we monitored all important file servers, name servers, print servers, and my boss's desk. It's called survival. And um, there's an awful lot in SNMP that's based upon survival. Um, um, I got involved in this stuff when I had been a big DECnet bigot and had been responsible for running the university's statewide network servicing. At that time, it was a large network with 50,000 users. Um, it's quite a bit bigger now. Um, but we had no tools. We got this new IP stuff dumped on us and we had no tools. And the proprietary tools that we had for managing DEC networks and IBM networks just didn't work with the IP stuff. And the only thing that you had at the time was telling that to the console port. And then you'd have to attach to a process number, which jumped around depending upon the vagaries of how the box booted, so you couldn't even write an expect script. Well, it was difficult to write an expect script to be able to figure out where the process was. So. You've been, you've been thrust into a similar situation. You want to know what went wrong, and you've got your network management stuff on one tool and this database on one platform, and your system stuff is in another, and your, and your application stuff is in yet another database. And trying to pull all this together to do event correlation takes a very hard problem and makes it nearly impossible. But if you can use a single consistent tool, it's, going to make, it's not going to make it easy, but it will make it easier. So. That's uh, talking about the MIB, the blue box, in terms of the evolution we've had there. Now let's talk about the evolution in terms of the protocol. The protocol is the third part of our protocol, of our, of our framework specification. The protocol is MIB independent. The protocol works with any properly defined MIB object, past, present, or future. And it really has three parts, protocol operations, transport mappings, and security and administration. It was first defined in RFC 1157 as one big furball, and it was broken into separate documents in SNMP version 2. And the security administration was not really completed until we got to SNMP version 3. So protocol operations, the first generation was RFC 1157, and went to a second version in 1993, and that's what we're running today, that second version. There was just recently a new work started in the IETF called Evolution of SNMP that is to flesh out the third generation of protocol operations. On the security side, there have been three versions. SNMP version one had the community-based SNMP. The second edition was the party-based SNMP version two nearly a complete disaster. And then the user-based SNMP version 3 was produced in 1998 and is what is available in several products today. Transport mappings went through two versions. In SNMP version 1, you could run SNMP over any transport you wanted as long as it was TCP IP. There was this choice. Uh, the actual syntax of the specification said choice. Choice number one was TCP IP, and there were no other choices. In SNMP version two, the transport mapping document was made so that it was much more transport independent, and, could, and mappings were defined for mapping on top of things like Novell, NetWare, IPX, AppleTalk, DDP. And that was important in the 1993 time frame. Not so important now, um, as most things speak IP natively. And there is no new work to, on the table right now to do a third version of transport mappings because we really just reverted back to what we had in the beginning. So the protocol has evolved independently of the other two parts, and the pieces within the protocol have evolved independently from one another. 
So then, what are some of the new features of SNM PV2C, the second version of the protocol? Added some new data types, like 64-bit counters. Got some improved efficiency and performance through a new get bulk operator where we can retrieve large blocks of data rapidly and efficiently. In SNMP version 1, the only thing that we had in terms of a notification was the trap. And the algorithm there was to send it and hope it got there. In SNMP version 2, a new inform operator was added, which is a basically a trap with an acknowledgment and a retry mechanism. Added richer error handling for errors and exceptions, improved sets for row creation and deletion, and that transport independence that I talked about. So what happened in SNMP version 3 then is that we built on that base of SNMP version 2, and the new features then of SNMP version 3 are the features that were inherited from SNMP version 2 plus those features that come in the area of security and administration. So what are the features that were inherited from SNMP V2C? Well, it's the list that we just saw, plus those in the area of security and administration. By security, I mean authentication, who's doing the communicating, and privacy, protecting it from eavesdropping. By administration, I mean authorization and view-based access control, support for multiple logical contexts, the naming of entities where entities are service providers like managers and agents, the naming of identities. Identities are service users like Joe or Operations Shift Supervisor or Optivity or OpenView, where an identity is a user, a group of users, an application, a group of applications, or some combination thereof. RFC 2571. No, I don't know why I remember that done. And the naming of information. We have a separation of people and policies. We authenticate by an individual or a group of individuals, and then we apply access control based upon that group. So Joe might be a member of the operator group, so Joe would have Joe's own cryptographic keys, but we would provide access control based upon what group Joe was in, the operator group. We have usernames, we have key management, we have the configuration of standards-based configuration of notification destinations. In SNMP version 1 and SNMP version 2, the way you assign a trap destination is different on every product that you go to. Now there's a standard MIB for that, standard format for doing so, and therefore a standard application can be built to administer that. Standardization of proxy relationships. All of this is remotely configurable via SNMP operations on standard MIB objects. The number one thing added by SNMP version 3 is security and administration. So let's look at the security threats and mechanisms that are addressed by SNMP version 3. There are four threats. The first three are in the area of authentication, and the fourth threat is in the area of privacy. The first threat is that of masquerade. And to defend against the masquerade threat, we need data origin authentication. In the masquerade threat, traffic between a manager and an agent is perhaps watched like someone eavesdrops on a community string, and then they see how the manager communicates with the agent. Then the interloper comes in and begins to pretend to be that manager station, and if he's able to pretend well enough, the agent wouldn't be able to tell whether he's getting his commands from the real manager or from an imposter. If we have strong data origin authentication, we can defend against that threat. The second threat is that of modification of information. And we need data integrity checks, end-to-end -end data integrity checks, to defend against the threat of modification of information. At NetWorld Plus Interop in Tokyo, we were uh, on the show floor at a time when the temperature was about 100 degrees Fahrenheit and the humidity was about 100 degrees Fahrenheit, but inside the router cabinets, the temperature was about 125 degrees Fahrenheit or more. And we literally fried the memory in some routers. And I remember that in one buffer, 
one byte of one buffer, I remember it changed the capital D into an at sign. Um, I think that's a single bit error. Um, it, it was fun to track down. But because we didn't have the packet came in, the checksum was computed on the fly, it was fine, it was put into memory. While in memory, its value changed, the packet came back out, the checksum was computed on the way back out. And the correct checksum was applied, so no checksum error was detected at the receiver on a hop-by-hop -hop basis. Well, we need end-to-end -end data integrity checks if we're going to defend against accidental alteration of data, like that single bit error. And, and, and be able to detect intentional ones as well. It's really the same problem whether it's accidental or intentional. The third threat is that of message stream modification, where messages are, are uh, reordered, uh, delayed, or replayed. And we put message timeliness indicators in the packet to be able to tell whether this packet that was between a legitimate manager and a legitimate agent is a recent one or whether it was in fact sent a year and a half ago and now they're just replaying the reboot command over and over and over again in, a, in, a, in an attack via message stream modification. The fourth threat is that of disclosure. In some sites it's important to uh, to protect the information that's contained in the management packets uh, from eavesdroppers. And to do that, we use data, data confidentiality provided through encryption. On my particular network, if someone's able to find out how many collisions there are in the Ethernet, I just really don't care. Um, I'm going to publish it perhaps in a report at the end of the month anyway. But in other sites, that's uh, considered uh, sensitive information as, as are other parameters. And they may want to use data confidentiality protect those data from disclosure. In the user-based security model, the first uh, security model that's defined for use with SMMP version 3, and there can be more, the message model is an unsigned long word ranging from 0 to 4,294,367,000, some number I can't remember, equal to 2 to the 32nd power minus 1. We can have up to 4 billion of them, and so far we've defined 4. So there's still some room for expansion. <laughs> And probably because of that, we probably won't have to have an SNMP version 4. There's probably enough room for expansion within that that we won't need to go to the next version. And if we do go to the next version, it'll be a long enough into the future, it'll be SNMP simply not my problem. <clears throat> but all of the mechanisms that have been defined and standardized so far um, are based upon private key technologies. There are some things in the work in terms of public key, but the ones that have been standardized so far are private key using MD5, the message digest algorithm 5, and the data encryption standard mode, both in private key mode. So the user-based authentication mechanism for authentication <clears throat> is based on MD5 message digest algorithm, HMAC MD596, which is the same algorithm that's used by IP security. This then pro indirectly provides data origin authentication defending against threat number one. If someone, um, uh, if the packet is signed by someone who knew the secret, we presume that that someone is who they say they are. It doesn't prove that they are who they say they are, it just proves that they're someone who knew the secret. And so that's why it indirectly provides data origin authentication. It directly defends against data modification attacks, providing an end-to-end -end checksum kind of function, a message digesting function, using a private key known both by the sender and the receiver. It's a 16-byte key that results in a 128-bit digest, which is then truncated to 96 bits before transmission. The secure hash algorithm is an optional, additional security algorithm for the digesting function, which is believed to be stronger and known to be slower. Those defend against threats one and two. Threat number three, message timeliness indicators. We put message time indicators into the packets so that you can look at the packet and see whether it's a recent packet or not, defending against certain message stream modification attacks. You can find out if the packet was sent in the last 128 seconds or not. So you're subject to a replay attack from the last uh, couple of minutes, but you're not subject to a replay attack from the last couple of decades. Um, so, and we use other things to 
protect against duplication of packets in the subnet, so this is actually quite adequate. The privacy mechanism is based upon, again, symmetric or private key mechanisms using the data encryption standard cipher block chaining mode, uh, providing protection against disclosure through encryption. Because it is encryption, it is subject to export controls and usage restrictions in some jurisdictions. Um, but it is 56-bit DES, so um, you can get an export license exemption in many cases uh, in general to everywhere but the terrible seven countries. And no, I'm not able to name for you the terrible seven countries, but I would bet that for most of you that's not where most of your revenue comes from. I can name some of them, North Korea, Libya, Cuba, Iran, Iraq, and I start getting in trouble uh, at that point. But there are multiple levels of compliance with regard to the encryption of data encryption standard due to the problems associated with international use. And, and uh, there, there are some problems of even if you have the technology of basically turning it on and using it in some jurisdictions, I believe that there are rules with regard to that in both France and Japan. It's not that it can't be used, you just have to uh, uh, you just have to follow the, the rules because the goal here is to keep your free time outside of jail. In terms of secret rules, note that these mechanisms depend upon private keys and an important thing about private keys is to keep your private keys private. And so therefore, uh, you can't put them on a post -it note on the front of the workstation. You can't put them in a world readable file. You can't uh, bootstrap them via TFTP over the network. Uh, you need to put your initial keys in out of band. Note then the importance, though, that if you're going to keep your secret key secret, you need to have a mechanism that allows you to do key management and change your keys from time to time, because without a standardized key mechanism, uh, you're not going to get key, good key hygiene, and, and all the assumptions that all this is based upon will not be valid. To that end, all of the modules, including the the ones that deal with cryptographic keys, have appropriate information modules, which is a synonym for a MIB, that uh, define the appropriate MIB instrumentation, including the key management stuff that we just talked about the need for. All of the uh, work is done with user-based, uh, string, user-friendly, string-based naming. Um, in, the, in the SNMP version 2, it was almost a complete disaster. A, a user was named with a with an object identifier of the form 1.3.6.4.1.something.something.something.abcd, where that's an IP address, a dot a number, and then another number between one and six. And you had to have six of these for every manager and six of these for every agent. And oh, by the way, there's no sharing allowed. So if an agent has two managers, it needs 12 of them um, for each user. And it was just a horrible nightmare. Here we use user-friendly string-based naming where the string is something like Joe or Optivity. Much, much less painful. I started to say user-friendly ASCII strings, but they're not ASCII strings. Uh, one of the changes that was made in SNMP version 3 is that we don't use ASCII strings. We use UTF-8 strings for international use. So that when you want to, uh, red, uh, you want to render someone's name uh, from uh, Scandinavia that has umlauts in their name, or you uh, wish to represent a character set, a 16-bit character set from the Middle East or the Far East, uh, kanji or, or uh, Japanese, Korean, Chinese, etc. Uh, you can do so and 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 render that in there in, in, with all the various character support. Now, you may not have heard of UTF-8, and you say, oh, no, it sounds hard. Well, let me reassure you uh, 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 that are not familiar with UTF-8 and are familiar with the ASCII, the first 127 characters of UTF-8 will look very familiar to you. So uh, you shouldn't be terribly worried about that. So if the uh, authentication and privacy mechanisms and algorithms are so similar to IP security, why don't we just use HTTP uh, over secure socket layer or, or IP security? And the answer is they're not alternatives because they only do part of the job. They give you the security and privacy, but they don't do any of the administration in terms of authorization, view-based access control, um, key management, configuration of notification destinations, support for logical context, and the like.
Furthermore, HTTP over secure socket layer runs over a connection-oriented transport, which rules it out for use if we're going to try to do enterprise-wide or ISP-wide fault management. Now, one important aspect of the uh, mechanism is its configurability. There are three levels of security level, no authentication and no privacy. Uh, we would call it no auth, no priv. Auth, no priv, and auth priv. The fourth combination of having no authentication with privacy, that would be the ability to pass a secret message anonymously, is, is maybe important for espionage if you want to uh, drop a roll of microfilm for your pickup to, without them knowing who you are. That might be important for espionage, but it's not important for management and is not supported by SNMP version 3 user-based security model. So you have three levels that you can build the fence up. No auth, no priv defends against all none of those four threats that we talked about earlier. And in that regard, it's a lot like SMP version 1 and SMP version 2, but has the other benefits of things like multiple logical contexts and, 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 and so forth. The second level is authentication with no privacy. That would defend against threats 1, 2, and 3, providing data origin authentication, message integrity checks, and message stream modification protection. The, fourth, the third level, authentication and privacy, defends against all four of the threats that we talked about, with you, the network administrator, deciding how much you want to spend on security, building the fence as high as you wish to build it, potentially on a transaction-by-transaction -transaction basis. I think most administrators are, are going to do all gets one way and all sets another way on a particular, for a particular destination. But for most folks, we think that they're going to, at a, at a relatively comfortable site, are going to do monitoring with no auth, no priv, and control with auth, and priv, auth no priv. If, however, uh, you work for an organization where the, uh, the security officer was someone who retired from the military after 25 years and doesn't know much about computer security but somehow became the computer security officer because they're responsible for all security in the organization and doesn't know about much about those computers but knows that more security is better, then you're going to use authentication privacy for every transaction and you will like it because that's what the policy will be at a, at a relatively paranoid site. Now, Privacy may possibly be limited. Uh, some vendors are not going to ship privacy because it's just uh, more paperwork uh, or they have to support multiple versions where they have a North American version and another version um, um, if they're not going to support it or they have to do paperwork. But mostly the difference is fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And, uh, uh, and, and down on the farm we have a saying. Uh, we shouldn't uh, confuse uh, excuses for reasons. There's uh, um, they may, they may give you a, a, a reason, but that may not be the same thing as an excuse, and the excuse may not be the same thing as a reason. Yes, please. I think we'll see that a lot. In other sites, um, they, they may do, they may, they may want a little more. Most people are relatively comfortable using monitoring today with SNMP version one and SNMP version two. Right, but they at least change the community from public to something else. They may change the community from public to something else. Is there something similar in SNMPv3 that you can change to something else? So yeah, it's called the username. So a username, no auth, no priv. You could use Joe could monitor with no auth, no priv, but Joe might require auth priv in order to do a set operation. Okay, and Bill might not be allowed to do anything even with... Bill, if it, are you Bill? I'm Bill. We're not going to let you have any access whatsoever. Good. Okay. <laughs> but you decide that. You decide that. Um, by the way, I did fail to go over one thing on this slide right here. I should have said there's a 16-byte key with eight bits, eight bytes of dev key, and eight bytes of initialization vector, and it looks like this is 64-bit dev, but it turns out that one of each of those bytes, one bit of each byte is a parity bit, so there's really only effectively 56-bit dev, and so it does fall just below the export control regulations. Yes. Are there any plans for using uh, digital envelope technology for uh, doing um, 
distribution of the private keys between the manager and their managed agents? There are a number of proposals there. Uh, one is a, a thing written by Mike St. John's that uh, on Diffie-Hellman key exchange in order to bootstrap keys with perfect forward security. That is an RFC that I don't remember the number of, but if you look back on an earlier slide, I had that number. Um, that is important uh, primarily for the cable modem industry because they've, uh, they've, they've specified that as a part of the DOCSIS cable modem spec version 2, or is it 1.2? 1.2. Okay. All right, where was I? Now, because we know Bill is out there, we're going to want to upgrade to FMMP version 3. Is it okay for me to pick on you? We're going to want to upgrade to SNMP version 3 and turn on security because we know that Bill and all of his cousins are out there. But we know that we can't upgrade the systems all at once. We can't do a flashbang upgrade. Some systems will never be upgraded because they were produced by companies that were bought by Cisco and Lucent. And, uh, <laughs> and if they were profitable, then resold by Lucent. Um, Virtually all products in this environment are expected to be multilingual. All products I've seen so far that support SNMP v3 continue to support SNMP version 1. And most also support SNMP version 2 and possibly other things like web-based management. And you can apply the view-based access control to all of these paths. So we could say that the SNMP version 1 user gets read-only access to a subset of the data, and in order to get more than that, you have to come in with SNMP version 3 to get full access and to get read-write access. In this kind of, and similarly, that we expect manager stations to be multilingual, supporting all three dialects of the protocol, version 1, version 2, and version 3. If it supports only version 1 and version 2, it would be said bilingual. What would we call something that supports only one language? Yeah. That'd be an American. American. <laughs> that was a joke. <laughs> but in this environment, a manager station is talking to an old agent. It sends an old packet. The agent processes according to old rules, and it sends back an old response. If it's talking to a new agent, it talks to it with a new packet, new rules, new response in a multilingual, trilingual kind of environment. All right, now when I point to this half over here, I want you to say, so what? When I point to this half over here, I want you to say, who cares? So what? Who cares? Good. So we've got all this SNMP v3 technology. So what? Who cares? Well, there are several good things that we think that operators, and this is, this is an interactive session, you see. Several things that you're going to like about SNMP version 3. The most important thing that comes with SNMP version 3 is that you're now able to practice safe sex. Sets. This allows you to do configuration and control and provisioning operations rather than just mere monitoring. This allows you to either augment or replace what you're using today for configuration, which is almost always proprietary CLI over Telnet, the universal management protocol. <laughs> <laughs> this allows you to have standards-based solutions that come through commercial-grade industrial strength security and that authentication and privacy. It's only commercial grade. You wouldn't want to use this for national secrets. But for the kind of work that we do, it's almost always going to be strong enough. And if it isn't strong enough, the spec is designed such that you can get an enterprise number of your own, design your own security algorithm, and this 32-bit number, the left three bytes would be your enterprise number, and the right byte, a number from 0 to 255, you can design up to 256 security algorithms of your own. And if you don't like it, if it's not strong enough, or if you have a specialized customer application, you can do something non-standard in a standard way and still apply view-based access control to it.
I'm not encouraging you to do that, but there is considerable extensibility built into the design so that this should stand the test of time for many years to come. Well, one thing that this gives us is the ability to distribute management out to intelligent agents and mid-level managers. This is important for scalability, allowing us to keep our local traffic local, and allowing us to have shorter feedback loops with lower latency. More on that in a bit. I talked about the view-based access control. This, let's talk about it a little more. It allows us to have various groups to have differentiated access based upon different levels of access so that you might give staff a different level of access than customers. And you might let engineering have a different level of access than the people who go to meetings and wear ties. Also, you might allow different groups to have access to different information. That is, customer one may be able to see different information than customer two is allowed to see. So some examples would be that some groups of users might get read-write access to all of the MIB data. That'd be you. Uh, some of your more junior staff might get read-write access to some subset of the MIB data. Other groups might get read-only access to all of the MIB data. Other groups would get access to a subset of the MIB data, and Bill gets no access at all. So what? Another thing, I've lost track as to which side's which. <laughs> Who cares is over here? You've got to move over here. <laughs> Another thing that you're going to like about SNMP version 3 is better notifications. As I said, in SNMP version 1, the algorithm was spray and pray. You consult the table that was put in there in some, some implementation-dependent fashion, and you'd send the trap to each of the management stations and their applications that were interested in that notification. In SNMP version 2, and therefore inherited by reference into SNMP version 3, we have the inform operator, where the, where the notification is sent and the sender then posts a timeout looking for a reply, an acknowledgment. And if it doesn't get that reply, then it does a resend. And we have adjustable parameters of retry count and retry interval. The retry count ranges from 0 to 2 billion, 2 to the 31st power minus 1. And the retry interval ranges from 0 to 2 billion, and the units are seconds. So you can retransmit up to 2 billion times with up to 67 years between retries. And if that's not enough for you, tough. Um, reproduce the problem and call me back, because by then, <laughs> that's not 67 years worth of retries. That's 67 years between retries. So it should be enough. I'll be retired by the time you're able to reproduce the problem. You designed it to last. You designed it to last, yes. Repetition is the key to learning. Let me say that again. Repetition is the key to learning. Now, of course, this doesn't make it reliable because there is no such thing as anything that's reliable in our business. When that backhoe digs up the cable and the cable is cut, this is not a retransmission algorithm problem. It's an electrical engineering problem. Down on the farm, we have a saying. You can teach a goldfish to play the piano if you can get enough voltage. And here you need more voltage. Um, so we don't guarantee results. We only guarantee how much effort our best effort is. But once the retry count is exhausted, we give up. So this was added. This inform operator was ordered. It was added in SNMP version 2C, but it had a few problems when we added it there. It wasn't done quite right, but those problems were fixed in SNMP version 3. There are now standard MIB objects to configure both the destinations and these retry parameters. And there's also source-side notification suppression. Okay. How many of you have a situation today where you're getting too many traps at your management station? Yeah. We spend an awful lot of effort generating notifications 
transmitting them through the network, delivering them to the management station. The management station dutifully logs them away. We run it through a filter, saying, is anybody interested in this? No, throwing it away at the destination. SNMP version 3 has source-side notification suppression. You will like this. You will like this a lot. So that you can say, I want to know when this interface goes up or down, but I don't care about when that interface goes up or down. You have that level of granularity. And you can say, I want to send all security-related events in this direction, and I want to send everything else in this direction. You have as much control over it as you wish to have. And it has the nice feature of the simple configurations are simple, like all is easy, none is easy, but if you, and all except is easy. But if you want to have, you know, if you want to do something really strange, like you want to have this, that, that one, but not that one, that one, or that one, it, it gets a little more hairy. But this allows you to use a standard MIB and standards-based tools to turn unwanted notifications off at their source. You, as I said, you will really like this. So what? This SNMP v3 stuff allows us to have these standards-based applications to manipulate these MIB, MIB objects. Our perception is that the, one of the reasons why SNMP version 2 party-based security model failed was because it was too difficult to administer. And there were no off-the-shelf tools available to assist that. Because the last thing that I needed when I was an administrator and an operator of a network was another thing to administer or operate. I was too busy chopping wood to sharpen my ax, if you know the story. Here we have some tools that help you do that. Um, in terms of some users like add new user wizard, username Joe. What group is Joe in? Multiple choice or add new group. Um, what kind of access does Joe get? And question by question, and then you find it, click on the finish, and it just does the right thing. Um, similarly, allowing you to configure things like authorization, access control rights, notification destinations. It also allows you to configure SNMP version 1 and SNMP version 2 parameters, such as community strings. Yes. But even though um, the other thing was that we had low frequency security at the switch level, but as you know, it's an SNMP one with community strings with the same home level devices. You lift and you lift the uh, rig right string off the switch in the middle of the room, and that was essentially a problem. And uh, this addressing SNMP three was even more. Yes, if he, his question was, he, had a, he experienced a situation where someone through the lack of physical, ac through the lack of physical security in terms of physical access to a device was able to monitor the network and steal eavesdrop on the community string and then use that to get control not only of the switch but also of the router because they use the same community string elsewhere. You need SNMP version 3, because if they're going to do that with SNMP version 3, if they study the packet, they're going to have to be very lucky to be able to be able to produce a different packet that will be able to be used. How lucky? One bit and two to the 96th power. They're going to have to be very lucky. So, so you know that if, if somebody breaks in, either they're very lucky, or the last time I was had it was because it was a guy was dating the operator, and um, she went to the other room to hang a tape, and he typed some commands at the console. Yes. Yes. 
www.snmp.com. JDC, those are my initials, Jeffrey Dean Case Tutorial.ppt. Now I think I can type 51, right? Yeah. It didn't work for you and you got garbage on your screen. Did you do it with Netscape or with? Internet Explorer. I did it with Explorer and it did just fine. It's assigning the wrong MIME type. Uh, I don't know what he's doing. What are you downloading it with? Just with the browser? We'll get it to the Nanog website shortly after the after the session. Okay. Sorry. A link is broken. I don't think it's there yet because I just finished. See, what happened was when I wrote this thing, it was a four-hour thing, and now it's a 90-minute thing. So I spent all day yesterday afternoon and all day today slicing and burning. Who cares? Who cares? Okay. How am I doing on schedule? Actually, I'm not in bad shape. Now, I understand in terms of community string management, this is important. I understand that I heard recently from two different ISPs who shall remain nameless, both of whom were large publicly traded companies. And their auditors went through their company as a part of the due diligence that you do with a publicly traded company. They said, now let me get this right. You do your revenue based upon what? And they said, well, customer billing based upon what? On traffic statistics and you collect those traffic statistics how? Well, we collect them with SNMP. What's the security of SNMP? And they explained it to them and the auditors all turned white. Now, one auditor from ISP number one said, well, what you need to do is you need to switch from SNMP version 1 to SNMP version 3 so that you've got strong security on the collection of data that protects your bottom line. A different auditor for ISP number 2 said, you need to change your community strings more often. <laughs> uh, this, uh, yeah, you need to change them after every packet. Um, the, uh, uh, um, the, um, but this tool for those for that ISP that wants to change their community strings more often can in fact through a standard MIB object now do change community strings more often. Another thing you'll like about SNMP version three is is uh, better performance. Get bulk was added in SNMP version two, but it didn't know how to negotiate maximum packet size, and that's important because it gets its improved performance providing less latency and lower overhead through a smaller number of bigger packets, giving you one to three orders of magnitude of, of improvement over SNMP version one, typically somewhere around two orders of magnitude. You tell me what number you want and I'll s tell you how to set up the experiment to get whatever number you want. Uh, it negotiates the maximum message size correctly in SNMP version three, which it was unable to do in SNMP version two. And we also get uh, less need to pull as often for those variables that are counter 64 variables in, in high-speed networks. And there are new features that eliminate the need for what I call gross hacks. Uh, and, and an example of that would be the support for multiple logical contexts. In 1992, we started working on the bridge MIB. And the bridge MIB assumed in 1992 the prototypical bridge was a deck land bridge, 100 or 200, five and a quarter inches by 19 inches, two ports, Ethernet to Ethernet. Could have been Ethernet to fiber, but, but they were both Ethernet uh, with different media. One bridge, one agent, one copy of the bridge MIB. And you had scalers like the root of the spanning tree. It is now... Mm, 2001. Okay. Who cares? Well, in 2001, we have these switches with 32 ports on them, and each port has its own bridge, its own copy of the bridge MIB. So we have 32 copies of the bridge MIB and one agent. And 32 identical scalers 
of the same name. So we need something to disambiguate. Now, which bridge are we talking to? We use gross hacks with SNMP version 1, like, well, this community string takes you to this virtual agent, and this community string takes you to the, that, that virtual agent. In SNMP version 3, we have additional syntactic sugar that makes the packet format a little sweeter with an actual field in there that helps you support multiple logical contexts, saying that I want you to process this packet in the context of bridge number 14, that sort of a thing. You will like this, eliminating these gross hacks. In SNMP version 3, we have better error handling. In SNMP version 1, this is inherited from SNMP version 2. In SNMP version 1, if you do a GET request with 10 items requested and one or more of those is unavailable, you get an error with no partial results. But in SNMP version 2 or version 3, you get back partial data with exceptions. You will like this. In a set request in SNMP version 1, if you get an error, you get no. In SNMP version 3, you get no because. You get richer error codes. So that we have richer errors and richer exceptions. Now, those are all the advantages of SNMP version 3 over prior versions. But there are some costs and some disadvantages with SNMP version 3. And to be fair, we should talk about those. First, security is expensive. If there's more for you to configure and to administer. There's not much easier than putting out community string, community string, community string, community string, and forgetting it forever. Uh, just, you know, put it out there once and it stays that way forever. It's my experience that when you're carrying the groceries into the house, it's easier if the door is unlocked. And if the door is locked and deadbolted, it's even more effort. Off-the-shelf tools help this somewhat, but and this is easier than the party-based SNMP version 2 by orders of magnitude, but it's still more difficult than community strings. There's more overhead. The message headers are longer and more complex. The cryptographic calculations can increase CPU load approximately 20-ish percent. You tell me which percent you want, and I'll tell you how to set up the experiment to yield that number. Um, approximately 20-ish. Is that enough waffle words in one bullet point? Um, um, it might be more. It might be less. Your mileage may vary. But it will run slower, and it will run a lot slower if you do software-based devs especially if that software-based DES is implemented in Java, 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 or should I say Java. <laughs> Mr. Perkins, yes. How much bigger is the message header? It depends. It depends upon a lot of things, but uh, you might go from typical of 15 octets, 15 bytes. An octet is an ossified byte. Um, from 15 bytes to 50 bytes of header. And if you're only moving one little thing, that's a significant percentage increase. But if you're m moving a full message of, of stuff, then it's not a, such a strong percentage increase. So the way that you adjust the percentage increase is by deciding how big of a packet you're moving with that header. And you can come up with any number you want. What percentage number do you want? I'll set up the experiment for you. Now, but I should, we, well, let's go back to this. Let's not confuse reasons and excuses. Some machines don't have the hardware assets, but almost all do. At NetWorld Plus Interop a couple of weeks ago, we had an interruptible power supply running with a 188 running at 4.77 megahertz. Not a Pentium 3, not a Pentium 2, not a Pentium, not a 486, 386, 286, 186, a half of a 186, a 188, running not, not at a gigahertz, but at 4.77 megahertz. It was running software-based DES written in C. You could still do multiple set requests per second with authentication and privacy. And unless you're going to use the UPS to blink the lights on and off in a, like a, to, to the rock music or something, how many set, per second, set requests per second do you need to do on a, on a low-end machine? Um, so um, there really are no excuses. We also implemented it in a machine that only had 128 bytes of non-volatile storage. So you can't have lots of users, but but you can do this. There are really not very many excuses for not being able to do this. 
There are disadvantages for you as operators in terms of shipping products and shipping packets worldwide. It's not impossible, it's just that it's a little more inconvenient if you have the software-based devs. And another disadvantage that's still there today is that there's incomplete product support. Some vendors claim customers, that would be you, don't care about security. Um, at this point, uh, they're using that as an excuse not to put it into their products. Um, at this point, ag agents are, are, are more completely supporting uh, SNMP version 3 than our manager stations and applications, but they are out there on both sides. It's also true that the SNMP version 3 code is often less mature and less shaken out. So what is this SNMP v3 stuff? It's the newest version. It's what SNMP version 2 should have been. It's still compatible with the SMI and the MIB that you've been using. You don't have to change your MIB in order to use SNMP version 3. It's an important enabling technology, giving you security and administration so that you can do configuration and control operations. It's pretty much available now. So there's a lot to like about this stuff, but we're not done yet. There's still more work to be done, uh, both by the standards community, by the vendors, and by you who have to deploy this technology and use it. So that takes me to the second part. We've talked about how it has evolved, and the second part talks about how it is still evolving, and I would like to discuss some recent and ongoing IETF work items. So what we've just shown, what we just finished, was, is to conclude that this is not the same old SNMP that your mother used in 1988. There have been many positive enhancements, and some more enhancements are nearly done and ready for implementation and deployment. Those would include things like SNMP-based configuration from the SNMP Comp Working Group, including policy-based management MIB and provisioning MIB for DIFSERV. And there are some other standardization work that's just getting started in the areas of the evolution of the SMI and the evolution of the protocol itself. So in terms of topics for this next section, we'd like to talk about the SMMP Configuration Management Working Group, the EOS Working Group, the SMING Working Group, some recent stuff on DISMAN, and then some MIB definitions. When we finish that, we'll have some conclusions and we'll be done. What's driving the standards effort is the same thing that's driving the market. Growth, scale, the lack of expert personnel, the need for seamlessness of not only the network, but the systems, the applications, and the services, the need for security. And the standards are, are, are important enabling technology in that. The driver of the day is the secure policy-based configuration of policy including the secure policy-based configuration of security policy and of DIFSERV policy and quality of service policy. Now, in this, it's important to note that I'm making multiple meanings of the term security and policy. So what do we mean by these multiple meanings of policy? We can have policy-based distribution of configurations. That is, I want to create, I want this application to distribute this new community string to all systems which have this old community string, and it, and it makes that distribution on a policy basis. Or I, wanted to, I want to select the targets of this configuration to be all units which run Solaris and an Apache web server. That'd be policy-based distribution. A second use of policy is when we're talking about we're inside a managed system, we're inside an agent, and we want to apply configuration rules on each instances of something, like each interface, or each process um, inside that managed system. Applying configuration A, for example, on every backbone interface and applying configuration B on all interfaces that go to the Dilbert cubicles. A, a third use of the word policy is where we are, con both of those, those, both of those first two were configuring with policy. This last one is the configuration of policy, a QOS policy or a security policy. And we use policy sometimes talking about configuring with and sometimes configuring of. Well, there is a working group that's been going for a while now called the SNMP-based Configuration Management Working Group. It has several goals. Uh, one goal is uh, to show best practices regarding how to do configuration management with SNMP, and they're producing a 
a BCP document, a best current practices document, as the deliverable to show how that can be done. Secondly, they're working to make it easier to do it. And uh, the deliverable there is the policy MIB module. Um, it's just another MIB. There are no fundamental changes in the architecture or the framework. It's just another special MIB module oriented towards managing with policy inside a managed system. That example number two from the previous slide. And third is it provides a worked out example while addressing pressing immediate needs. There's an immediate need to have standards-based configuration of QoS policy and um, through DiffServe and um, there's a complete worked out example for how to provision a QoS policy. And down on the farm we have a saying, one example is worth two books and it, it gives you a good example there. There are several challenges here. One is to configure multiple parameters with many instances at the same time being as best we can being vendor independent so that this works on any vendor's box independent of what, C unlike what CLI does where each time you go to a new box you have to have a new CLI, a new vendor, and sometimes different boxes from the same vendor. We want to be technology independent. So we want to configure QoS policy the same way, whether the underlying technology is ATM or DiffServe or whatever. And we want to be instant independent. We want to work at a higher level of abstraction. To the maximum extent possible, we want to have all this configuration management integrated with our fault management and our performance monitoring and the like so that we can do, uh, do a single, consistent, seamless environment. Toward that end, and our second use of policy, there's this thing called the Policy Management MIB module, or PM MIB for short. It uses structured scripts to do policy-based configuration of standard and vendor-specific objects, standard MIB objects that you already have. A policy in the PM MIB is a pairing of a filter rule and, a, and an action. And those filter rules can be simpler complex, and the action can be simpler complex. And the filter rule selects the applicable elements, and then the action is applied to those elements if the rule fires. So the form is like, if an element has certain characteristics, then apply the operation to that element. Or if policy filter, then policy action. Now these policy filters and policy actions are at the management level, not on a per packet basis like a QOS policy would be. You would use this policy to configure the QOS policy. That yes. decision gets made on the device? That decision gets made on the device. You can plug your whole network with this, this command that, and the device makes the decision about whether or not it's applied. You could use the first type of policy-based management to put it on all the systems that support policy-based management within the system. Then you'd use the second type of policy-based management within the system to decide, I'm going to apply this to each interface on the system within the system. And then I'd use that to configure the third kind of policy, which is if I have gold service, then apply DSCP equals five on it. Okay? And that's why all this policy stuff is so hard to understand is we've got three things at three levels of abstraction, all called policy. I would understand that a couple of vendors are working on getting their configs to be, um, so you can put them in XML. Um, right. Why, I mean, it would seem like a logical step to have the policy script be XML such that you can write one config and have it work. <laughs> Is there a reason translators will pop up? Well, uh, okay. There's two different things. One is having the script run in the target system and having it be able to access the instrumentation. And the second is be able to get the script from the manager to the managed system. Those are two quite independent problems. Let me do some more examples and it may help you understand. And if I, if when I get done with this, it still isn't clearer, then come back at me, okay? What's your name? Austin. Austin. Austin, okay. Now this policy script language that we write these scripts in will look familiar to you if you're careful, comfortable with curly braces and semicolons. Um, if you, you, it's sort of like a lowest common denominator, best hits album sort of part of uh, C Perl, C++, a little of this, a little of that. But it's a simple subset. We don't have pointers, we don't have structures, we don't have type variables, we don't have objects or classes, but we do have expressions, variables, and looping. 
So you can apply this policy then. You can say for each interface in the box, then apply this rule. Or for each circuit in the box, apply this rule. So if you had a, a policy filter that said trunk and Ethernet and 100 megabit, you might say for each of those that have those characteristics, I want to turn auto negotiation off. Instead of having a manager a plot 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 interfaces, instead of the manager doing 14 set requests of applying the auto negotiation parameter on or off, by value, we instead download it by reference, saying if this, then that. Similarly, if the rule was Ethernet and access and gold, again, then we might want to say, let's turn on this particular marker or dropper or filter, etc. But we're downloading the configuration data by reference rather than by value, and that's very powerful. It allows us to leverage our existing infrastructure, tools, and MIBs, which the XML solution would not do. We already have MIB objects that allow us to monitor and to some extent control these devices. That kind of simplicity is going to give us time to market, and we don't have to start from scratch on our instrumentation. We can have it be simple, we can have it be complex to give us as much flexibility as we need for real-world problems. But don't underestimate the power of configuring by reference versus by value, grossly reducing the amount of configuration data that has to be sent. On a box that has 14 interfaces, it doesn't matter what you use to configure it, anything will work. But when the thing's got 500 interfaces, it starts getting more interesting. And when it's a really large box, suppose the possibility where you have five uh, configuration parameters on 500 interfaces you might have to do 2500 parameters need to be set but if they were common and they were pointing to template a versus template b versus template c and you wanted to change all of them all you have to do is update the template because we're configuring by reference to that template inside the box so that all ports that are going to dilbert cubicles are configured a certain way then then you can change them all simultaneously yeah. Yes. About six slides back, you said. One, two, three, four, five, six. Seven. What? Uh, let me tell you what what comment I, I want to make. And then you can tell me what slide it was. Sure, Bob. You said, I thought, that part of what this was doing was letting you, you do this scripting activity in a technology independent way so that you could have a script that worked for both ATM and GIF serve. That is a challenge that you would like to achieve. I, I would like to achieve that as well and I have been trying for years and have made basically zero progress with it. You have to have, if you're going to hide that kind of complexity, today what you have to do is you have to have a script in the management station that says, if box A, then do configuration, uh, configuration this, and, if, and if, it's a, if it's a Cisco, do this, if it's a Nortel, do that. A script in the management station. That's what you have to do today. But there's nothing to keep you from downloading a more complex script down to the box that says, what am I? And if I am one of these, do this. And if I am one of those, do that. It isn't ideal. And it has to do with, to the extent that we are able to have standards hide the differences in the details, the scripts can become more identical. And to the extent that standards don't hide the differences and those pop through, then that, those differences are reflected in the complexity of our scripts. Mr. Perkins. Now, yes. Um, those things seem pretty bad. Oh, here. Yeah. Stay tuned. I'm gonna keep. Let me keep going. I got to cover the basics before I can talk about static versus dynamic. Dynamics later. Hang, hang on. So if we wanted to take that 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 filter rule, 
the pseudocode would be, say, is an Ethernet and is operational and gets gold or silver service would be scripted as we go get the interface type, which is a standard MIB object that's available in, in most products today. It's been a part of MIB2 since 1988. And if it's equal to CFMACD, which I think is the integer 6, and we get the variable called IP, IF opera status if the interface is up, and if the, the role associated with that interface is gold or silver, then we would take the filter action. So here, this is the same filter. The action might be we want to set the interface to be down. Should I miss the role definition? A role is something that the network administrator assigns. So it's a description, just an extension, where, where is it? It's like a pseudo MIB object. It's a, 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 an administratively assigned value that you might say, that guy is my boss. So the string might be, if this or this or this or this or my boss, then monitor his desk. <laughs> okay? It's something that isn't, that typically isn't geographic. It is, it, it's, it's, it's not, it's not something that's, it, it's typically a relationship that isn't directly monitorable. It's an attribute that's assigned by the administrator. Generalized string attribute similar to a description. Yes. But not like a MIB description clause. It's just a, it's a string. I mean, it's a tag. It's a label. Mm -hmm. So, suppose that I wanted to, and I think I may have dropped a knot in this filter. I think I may, I, there may actually be a bug in this. Because this is Waldbuster's slide and I cooked it a little bit. And I think I may have broken it. So, first I say is, does the rule filter fire here? No. Does it filter fire here? No. Here, the filter should fire, and I set the interface to be down. And so I can have rules that are like, if they're supposed to, if this cubicle is occupied, give them good link. And if they're not occupied, if they don't have, then I might set up virtual circuits, I might set up security policy, I might do lots of stuff for it. And if it's not, I just shut it down altogether so that people walking through the office landscape plugging in can't just get arbitrary access. And you can have, if this happens, otherwise you do that. How, how long has this been churning? And I guess, I guess About a year. What was the driver for, for putting more smarts on the boxes? What was the driver for putting more smarts on the boxes? We've been wanting to put more smarts on the boxes for years, but we couldn't until we had security. Because if you want an intelligent box, you have to configure it, and if you're going to configure it, you have to have security to be able to configure it. So we had to wait on enabling technology to allow this to happen until rel relatively recently. So the scripting gives you a flexible and under understandable way to express policy. And most IT personnel like the power of scripting. It's much more flexible than simple string matching that we're doing when we're manipulating these scripts up on the management station and, and doing config files that get distributed via FTP or XML or whatever. The policies can be based upon operational status, giving us feedback and dynamic nature in real time, um, based upon statuses of interfaces, utilization, and allowing us to have much richer sets of policies. We can do things based on scheduling, like business calendars uh, and uh, uh, video conferencing with overlapping policies, allowing us to use a precedence tree to find the best policy in conflict. So you can say, turn everything off, and then a policy above that that says, under certain conditions, turn certain things on, so that, that, that one policy shows through the other. So a, 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 a conflict is not necessarily a bad thing. We have error recovery because errors are going to happen, scripts are going to be busted, and this helps us meet service level goals. So if one policy fails, we can have another policy pop out below it being resolved by this PM policy precedent. And we get a notification, an optional notification, if a policy encounters an error. Now, you as operators need to have a full, complete environment if you're going to deploy this stuff in the field, and we've done our best to look at things like putting in the ability to test the policy and know what things fire under what conditions, including also the ability to disable a particular policy on a particular element so that you can take over control over the policy-based stuff, what we call the limp 
home mode uh, until a policy is fixed. Now, of course, you want to be able to have places, people need to have procedures to document that so that then when the day shift comes in the next day that, that, you, that, that, that the right things happen. We can tie the configuration to fault and performance data that we can't do if we do everything with XML. If an interface fails, we can take a particular action with a tie between the fault management and the configuration management. We can do collection of statistics optionally based upon a configuration. Instead of collecting interface statistics on every interface, we can select it on only certain ones that have role strings, for example. It's all built with existing infrastructure and existing tools, so we don't have to worry about how we're going to secure it because we already are building on top of SNMP, which has security if we're using SNMP version 3, leveraging our existing investment and existing MIBs, and we've tried to make it a complete package, including those interoperational aspects we talked about. I think you'll like the way this MIB module works to configure diffServe uh, via the diffServe MIB and the diffServe provisioning MIB modules and the worked out example. The same approach can and will be used in other areas of configuration, such as the policy-based configuration of security policy for routing and others. Did I address your two questions? No. You ask it again. All right. Well, the vendors are working on a way to, to configure the machine by logging in by telling them whatever, loading a config by a, in a given format, where the config itself is XML and it does all this stuff, right? Okay. I mean, but XML can carry anything. Just having it be on top of XML doesn't give you any standards, just as CLI over Telnet isn't standard. The Telnet part's standard, but this company's CLI is different from that company's CLI, and if this company's XML is different from that company's XML, all you did was get a more powerful Telnet. That's true. Traditionally, and MMP has followed the technology. Right. I mean, but that's, I mean, I can't speak for everybody else, but that's sort of, that's sort of what I would want, is something that I can use to send by SNMP something that I can paste into the router and get to the same kind of response. The idea being that I would have a, a common interface to it, and if at some point it would be possible to convince the routers to use some common XML terminology, that would be super. Well, note that you can do that today to the extent that vendors support standard MIB objects. You could move the configuration from the manager to the agent without the PM MIB with SNMP set requests on standard MIB objects to the extent that they implement those standard MIB objects. But I want to be able to use the same syntax that the vendor supports through other methods. Okay. That's, that's the advantage that I would want. In order to talk to my boss and say, hey, rather than writing my own config parser or something like that, I'll probably have to do anyway, to be able to use SNMP versus, you know, having a different CLI um, module for every different vendor we have, in order to do that, that is what we would want. I mean, that would be the step that we would want, something where we can do the same syntax through SNMP that we can do other places and get the same results. And the hard part of that is the modeling, to try to make this vendor's guts it, this vendor's product's guts be configured the same way that this vendor's product's guts are configured. How we express that and how we move it is relatively easy once we get a model that reflects both of them equally. The modeling is the hard part. Let me give you just a, a real trivial example. You want to identify a port. Some people start with zero, some people start with one. Some people say you have to identify it by slot, uh, sub-module, uh, and sub identifier. Some don't have sub modules, so they don't have that. So trying to get everybody to do it the same way. And that's the challenge is to get the semantics of the management information to be aligned. How we move it, whether it's via SNMP or XML over something, that's relatively un unimportant, although I am unabashed SNMP bigot, and I know that's not a shock to you. The SNMP movement of it is relatively unimportant. Having a consistent naming style, having a consistent data definition language that when this person says an integer, they mean the same thing that this person means. That's the important part. And the XML is just another way of moving the same old proprietary crap that we used to have, and it doesn't buy you diddly squat.
but yeah, moving is fairly generalized. And a vendor will come out and their new policy definition of how they'll do policy routing is their feature which sets them aside and says, you know, QNOS has, has a much better, cooler way of doing policy which you have to have abstract into a single type of syntax. You've gotten over, you're, you're getting rid of innovation. Your point, of the, your point is, is that there's the, that vendors don't want configuration to be a commodity item. Or, or you're you're saying follow the money. You're also reducing innovation options. Understood. Understood. Dave and then Dave and then I really need to move on. He, he, he waved. I just wanted to say uh, I come from a router vendor and we haven't, uh, router vendors have not agreed to standardize the CLI. What makes you think they got to standardize the XML? I, I don't want it standardized, uh, but what would be handy, I mean, sure, it would be nice to have it standardized. Yeah. <laughs> One can only hope. But it was nice that they have a consistent interface to it so that just as an example, you take a, you know, the Junipers we have, we've been using SSH but longer. And so the tools we have, the SSH into the routers do, um, we have our own screwy system for getting to the point where we enable and then get to the point where we can blast the config onto the box. It would be nice to use SNMP as a transport. I don't have to screw around with that. It would be nice if all they did was give you a single proprietary set of proprietary MIB objects called set CLI, where you poke this octet string, it's as if you typed it after having done all that junk you said. That would be a major quantum step forward, but you'll never get them to do it. How many providers use a single password, single login, you know, backdoor type thing, or, or versus security? I think anybody who works for Solve is using security, or an OP, or some sort of key gen that's continuously changing. Um, you know, how, how I wasn't here for your security model, who's definitely impressed in MP3, I know there is some but essentially you're going to have a backdoor password that lets people go in and make large configuration changes. Well, SNMP version 3 is not is, is going to be as strong as the secure ID stuff. It's going to be of the same order of magnitude of security. But, but secure ID is continuously changing key at any given time. I mean, for every one little fob is constantly changing. Yes. Is, is there that model within SNMP 3? I mean, you can't script that is what I'm trying to say. You, it is, it, it, if I worked all day, I might be able to figure out how I could send identical packets, but in general, you're going to find every packet is unique and non-reproduced. There's an exception to every rule, and if I worked really hard, I could come up with that exception. You can't script the automated login to multiple devices without some sort of backdoor. If you want the level of security that I think most, for the most. So what back to the security ID for logging in because you're using Tomax or Google. Good point. Yeah. yeah. Clear. And so so it's a TV3 authentication. Probably if we have legitimate security, security you may not be able to. Well, what you will find is that every SNMP application entity that is authoritative in the user namespace has its own crypto key so that even if my passphrase is chocolate is one of the four food groups and you get my crypto key compromised on that agent, because there is key localization, you can't get into that agent. It's host hacking and people doing key loggers and people uh, root kidding you and changing your SSH client. And, I mean, that's what security is for. You missed my security talk, but I think you would find that if you heard it, you'd be able to sleep at night. You will like this. If you read the SNMP v3 specifications, you will be able to sleep at night. Well, no, you start reading them, you will be asleep before you get through them. You, it's bad when you have to explain your jokes. Um, EOS. Protocol portions in the second generation, now working on a third generation. Enhancements primarily focus around performance and efficiency. A 
efficiency through OID suppression and compression. When you're, con when you're yanking back a large table of interface statistics with each row of the interfaces table and say a half a dozen of the columns, there's an awful lot of repeated object identifier information in the packet. EOS is working on eliminating a great deal of that redundancy and getting efficiency through, re through suppressing and compressing that redundancy. Some enhanced table manipulation work, improved row operations, and support for some new data types. That work has been underway for about uh, between three and six months now, and uh, it's coming along nicely. Doing a small number of tightly focused changes, I, I think you're going to like it. SMING is working on uh, the next generation for the data definition language, the SMI. They are currently compiling and winnowing requirements. I just came from a meeting which went through 75 different requirements. It is motivated to have a single protocol independent data definition language to eliminate wasteful duplication between MIBs and PIBs. And the goal is to have realistic requirements that can be supported both by SNMP transport and the COPS PR protocol transport. Now, it is really a best hits album of the SMI v2 from the SNMP space and the SPPI from, which is its logical equivalent in the COPS PR space. Plus, that was what they were primarily chartered to do, plus some other enhancements. And these are still being decided, and I guarantee you that not all of these will make the cut. There's some work in the area of general cleanup and housekeeping. There's some work in the area of additional data types, signed and unsigned 64-bit integers. There's a proposal on the table to have 32, 64, and 128-bit floating point numbers. How many of you need floating point, 128-bit floating point to manage your network? I didn't think so. Uh, unions and discriminated unions, arrays, aggregate data types, a complete new C-like grammar and syntax, including language extensibility, object-oriented design features, including classes, inheritance, containment, methods, procedures, and all kinds of constraints and associations. <laughs> These people are seriously over the edge. Not all of the proposals will make the cut. <laughs> and if some of you were to come to the meetings, it would help. In severe need of adult supervision. <laughs> <laughs> Not all the proposals will make the cut. You can help. DivMan, distributed management. It's possible to have intelligent agents or mid-level managers doing distributed management. We talked about this briefly, that intelligence requires configuration, and configuration requires security, or to say it another way, that security enables configuration, and configuration enables intelligence. There have been multiple proprietary MIBs in the space for years, and the IETF DISMAN working group is adding standardization to some of those. It was chartered to define MIB specs for distributed network management applications, where you configure this remote manager as an SNMP agent. You talk to the agent part, and you're configuring, you're doing management, you're doing application management. You're configuring and controlling an application. It just happens that that application is a management application. So you tell it what to poll and how much to poll sort of things. It allows you to offload polling, keeping the local polling local. And proximity, from, by keeping things local, gives us lower latency and shorter feedback loops. And this is real important for scalability. Now, they've got several published work products that are already available in products today and several works in progress. The schedule MIB allows us to do things on a time-driven execution. The script MIB allows us to move uh, generalized management scripts around. It doesn't standardize the scripting language. The remote operations MIB gives us standard MIB objects for doing ping and trace route as well as DNS lookup. The event MIB allows us to take actions based upon thresholds and uh, say watch that MIB object over there and if it goes unaccessible or if its rate exceeds a certain amount, tell me it. Um, I don't know. I don't know. You have to look at the document. I, I, I'm, I didn't write that one. That's not one of mine. 
The notification log nib keeps track of notifications that you might not have heard while you were away. And a bunch of stuff on aligning with uh, alarm work and IP telephony kind of stuff. The last section I wanted to talk about before we go to conclusions is MIB definitions. We've talked about some of these, that there are multiple standards track specifications allowing us to monitor not just the network, but things like WW MIB, application MIB, SysApple MIB, network services monitoring MIB, and the host resources MIB, and then all that network stuff. You can use these these to uh, monitor your and your customers' mission-critical systems like your DNS server, your web server, e-commerce server, stuff like that. Yeah. Yes, I'm going to ask a question. Sure. Um, uh, what's the current state of Microsoft implementation of SNMP at, um, um, I, I at this moment, at this moment, uh, I met with Microsoft in Redmond uh, on Friday, like three days ago, and I talked to the guy who's responsible for that piece of agent code for Win32 server, and but he's really working on X, XP. At this moment, it supports SNMPv1 and SNMPv2C, and uh, they are at this point uh, saying that they don't see uh, sufficient customer demand for security. How can they still demand? Hit them over the head. I don't know. Um, how do you get Microsoft's attention? You need more voltage. Thunk. Um, clear. Thunk. Um, um, however, there is, a, 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 there is some hope. Um, they um, are doing a cable box that requires them to do SMMPv3, and through that, perhaps we can infect the whole company. But uh, as of right now, they're focused on the instrumentation side of uh, 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 SIM-based instrumentation, and, but that's all intra-box stuff, not inter-box stuff at this point in time. Any of the inter-box stuff runs over proprietary stuff like COM and DCOM kind of things. Yes, they do implement community strings. Anybody can view them, and um, and uh, Solaris has the same problem. They just uh, but um, and anybody who runs SNMPv1 or V2 only has that has that problem. No, you just have to go buy an SNMPv3 agent. You take the one off that comes with the system, and you put another one on in its place, and you just keep on going. Just as if you don't like their their mail tool, and you want to put your mail tool on it, or whatever. Conclusions. Yep, there is a team doing that. What would you like to say about it? There are people currently working on how to redo the MIB2 pieces and other routing pieces and stuff like that to update it for IPv6. Yes, there is a team doing that. The documents are the first draft of all the of all the documents that have been published. The internet drafts that we are looking for comments. Good. What's the number we're looking? What draft type and I. IETF hyphen hyphen look for look for RFC IPv6 it's it's draft something 2011 update or something like that and similar to 2012 yeah in addition um, Merit IDR just announced um, some extensions that they are trying to get the group together to do on each of those good um, like I'm really pushing for a number of prefixes um, now from neighbor, like, that would be very useful for me to grab um, a number of updates from neighbor, things like that. So. Okay. Too bad Bird isn't here. Bert the, uh, was standing right by the phone for a few minutes. He's the guy who controls new work items in the IETF in the area of management. He's here. I'll, I'll He'll be here through Wednesday evening. Um, if you want me to introduce you to him, to, to, so you can tell him that you want to work on this new thing. Uh, it, I've already responded to the IDR. Cool. All right. 
So let me wrap up here. I only have a few more slides and then a few more minutes for Q&A, and then we'll go get some <laughs> beer in boxes. What's it called? Beer and gear. So this original short-term interim standard's now been around for over a decade. According to the pundits, it's been on its last legs every year since 1988. <laughs> and it's going to be eclipsed by uh, its replacement. But in the meantime, it's still growing. Our business at SNMP Research grew over 40% last year, and during the first quarter of this year, we grew another 40%, which is kind of... But for a protocol that's on its last legs, that's, that's pretty amazing. It's expanding the scope and evolving while the replacements come and go. And, and, and you know, when you have your high school class reunion, it's fun to think now, whatever happened to, uh, whatever happened to CMIP over TCP IP? Whatever happened to the o Open Software Foundation distributed management environment? Whatever ha happened to the DMTF, DMI, and MIF? and so forth and so on. In, 19, in 1998, Jamapi uh, was going to replace. Jamapi over Java was going to replace. It was the thing that was going to replace all SNMP. It was the silver bullet. The next year, it was JDMK over Java um, was going to be the thing that replaced SNMP and so forth. So, and we're not done yet. There's going to be more stuff to come. There's going to be more stuff to come, and many of them will come. They will be announced as the new nirvana. They will peak, and then they will wane. But someday, one of them is going to come along and provide more value, more bang for the buck than the Internet Standard Management Framework. And at that point in time, SNMP will be put out to pasture as it should be. But in the meantime, this stuff is evolved. It's not just for networks. It's secure. It's sturdy, standing the test of time. But we're not done yet. There's more work to be done in the area of additional standards, in the area of better applications. Boy, do we need better applications. Do we need more management, better management station products? We need more implementation. We need, need more deployment. This stuff is far from perfect, but it is still the best game in town. It's my opinion that the architecture and the vision are fine, but we need to do more in terms of the execution. In fact, there's some vendors we need to execute. Um, <laughs> you, don't, you don't get to live that vision with products that, that fully implement that vision, in part because the vendors aren't supplying complete and compliant products to you. And the vendors are not fully implementing and supplying products based on that vision, in part because you're not insisting that they do. You have the tools that you have because that's, you're willing to buy them. And as long as you put up with what you're getting, you're going to continue to get it. As I said, some vendors claim they see no market demand for secure management. Um, but there is a new protocol that's available that's an alternative to scripts and proprietary CLI over Telnet. It's called SNMP. <laughs> and now, I put off a question there, and I think I saw another one out of the corner of my eye. Go ahead. And I, I'm, by the way, I finished with four minutes to spare. Do you see any replacements for um, uh, the MTF D line? Uh, I'm spending a lot of my life uh, doing cross mapping of MIPS to MIPS you know, with SNMPX, DMID, Sundoxes, and everything. Frankly, it's driving me nuts. Well, DMTF DMI has largely been eclipsed by DMTF SIM. Yep. And so DMI. Just how is it? And, and on, on Windows boxes, that, that interface, that programmatic interface, has been replaced by the WMI. And the WMI, the Windows Management Interface, is the way of the future for Microsoft. I wouldn't spend a lot of time investing in, in the DMI interface or the MIF grammar. I wouldn't. Other questions or comments? Well, yes, sir. Still didn't answer your question. Well, I guess you, I mean, you did, but... Why do you want another different weird thing? Go back. The 
reason is RFC 2037, the entity myth, all right, which I have become intimately familiar with. You have my deepest sympathy. And, and let me tell you something about this, all right, for people who don't know. This is um, a myth. Uh, it's, it's actually a, it's as close to the standard as anything gas, as I understand it. But, uh, and it, it was an RFC written by um, somebody who works at a large vendor, and then the vendor took it and implemented it on half of their products and obsoleted their other mechanism for uh, figuring out what hardware is on a device, and then uh, no other vendor implemented it. So now, in order to find out what cards you have and what box, you have to use all the different proprietary MIBs, and then you also get the pleasure of using the big vendor's proprietary MIB and the standard MIB. Um, and that's, I mean, the problem with having... What? There's nothing about XML that will change that. You just get different types of XML. That's right, and, that, and, and that's fine. My point is, is you're not going to be able to get the vendors to implement this in a fashion that works. They just, they're not going to do it. This is why I'm saying, if I can take a configuration and I can use SNMP securely as a transport mechanism to put in what the vendor is going to give me, I can convince the vendor to take the time and add a small amount of code to add it as a transport mechanism, but there is no way that the vendors are going to take the time to implement that. I mean, it looks cool. It sounds cool. It's neat. It's a neat idea. It's nice if you have a standard interface for doing configuration, but they're not going to do it. What you don't know about the Entity MIB is that before there was a thing called the Entity MIB and an Entity MIB working group, but there was a Chassis MIB and a Chassis MIB working group. And I was the chair of the Chassis MIB working group. And I determined that the whole effort to do a Chassis MIB was so hopeless that I convinced the IETF leadership to shut the working group down and disband it without publishing a result because it was hopeless because of all of the different factions pulling it different directions. After that happened, later, people came back behind and it started up this entity MIB, and guess what? It was still just as hopeless under a different name. But this whole idea of a table of contents. But if you believe that you don't have power over the vendors, that's part of the problem because you do have power over those vendors. They do listen to what you tell them, and if you tell them that you want them to support the entity MIB, they probably will although that's a particularly bad example because that's a particularly difficult one to support. The other thing that would be helpful if you had been in the chassis MIB working group or if you had been in the entity MIB working group and you had been in the definition side of this stuff, some of the brain damage that came out of it might not have happened. So if we can get help from people who are operating networks on a daily basis and feeding real requirements into the process, we will get a better result that you will like better. But I don't see how having something brand new and different and incompatible is going to help you any. The, the reason is, is because once you have these baby steps, you get a common transport mechanism for dumping and config, and you use XML. Now, it's going to be different XML everywhere, but the reality is, is when Cisco says, this is what my XML look, looks like, Brenders, you know, vendor Z is going to come out, and that is what they're going to emulate. And well, I disagree because they'll have a copyright just like they do the MIPS. They have MIPS. Why don't we do the same MIPS if we can? We're not allowed to. Do well, then, if if you have some idea of what a couple of vendors are coming with, you you, know, you write up an RFC that has a couple of suggestions for doing it the way that they're starting to do it, and here's what something might look like. So then you can copy something like that. That's how you can start. You're but doing it in SMP? What? We're doing it in SMP. Okay. We're moving around stuff as much as possible to support standard SMP. So they'll do that. That's going to be the one. Takes up five to something. But, I mean, but what, <laughs> what, there, is that, there is that problem. So, yeah, hey, five a month, doesn't it? 